So, oh wow, is this real? I just got a breaking news alert that Ted Cruz is suspending his presidential campaign. Um, wow. Wow. That's amazing. Chris! <laughs> Hi! Oh, How what? are you? <laughs> Sorry, I was yapping, yapping there. Everyone, this is Chris Hale, my guest for the evening. Um, shifting gears a bit, I know I'm all over the place, but I really didn't have a better place to put. I had to couch the Afini stuff in something else because otherwise I would be a little bit of an emotional mess for the rest of the evening. But I'm talking to someone else who has definitely brought change and doesn't mind rattling some some fences. <laughs> How are you doing this evening? Doing well. I'm curious as to whether Cruz, uh, I guess I'd like to call him Eduardo, whether he dropped out over the allegations of his father being associated with Kennedy's killing. What do you think? Oh, wow. No, see, I'm just now, because I have been at work all day, haven't seen anything. This is, okay, so I'll just let everybody know, Bernie is still winning, and he's running away with highly populated county, so he's still winning in the end. It's 52.3 to 47.7, but this Cruz thing, and what you just said, I have to look into that, because I, I don't think I paid attention to that. Wow, I definitely think so, because I know there's been a lot of there's been a lot of like jokes and stuff here and there about his father and his past and stuff, but that that one actually um, that could do something. So that came out today. Did it? Okay, so I <laughs> I've been preparing for today and did not look for that. So I'm I'm the seat. Chris Chris has already taught me something. So Chris, friends of water, citizen lobbying, climate action, talk to me. Wow, it's been it's been busy lately in West Virginia. So one fun fact, I don't with with Friends of Water, of course, I just want to give a disclaimer. I don't Go ahead. I don't um, I don't want to advocate for any specific candidates because we right. first try to educate people on nonpartisan clean water voting action in terms of laying out information about the candidates and their issues. Um, I see that Bernie is leading in the polls here in West Virginia. Was that's an interesting turn? Yeah, and I saw Hillary got a little bit of a beating on some of her cold comments. I mean, you know better than I do, or as well as I do, or you know, you probably know better than I do that you can't go to West Virginia and start hating on coal. No matter how abusive the industry has been to the people, you still have to be sensitive to the fact that it is some people's livelihood is it's of institutions, better or worse. Um, <laughs> And it's a very delicate way you had to have those conversations in some areas, particularly if you're not from there. Um, so I saw she got some pushback over some comments she made recently. And she tried to clean it up some, but um, so what's what's I saw that there is you've been talking with someone again. You're not, and I get that. So Friends of Water um, is an organization that started out of basically the West Virginia water crisis, right? Two years ago. Correct. I mean, you've been doing other stuff before then, but that was the genesis, though, of Friends of Water specifically. Sure. When when the water crisis happened, I was working in Florida, in the Jacksonville area, petitioning for a ballot initiative. That's okay. Had over six hundred thousand signatures to put three percent of the state budget toward clean water and land conservation. And while that was happening, the chemicals still happened. And right. I wanted to help, and I started Friends of Water and. We got a good team together, and we started engaging in citizen lobby work directly in the middle of that legislative session. And we were actually quite successful in putting our legislators on the cold, so to speak, and having a direct impact on some of their decisions, I think, by putting their feet to the fire. Okay, that sounds good. That sounds like a, what a lot of people are talking about. They want to do now on a host of different issues. So, with the citizens, with like with the citizens' climate lobbying, with the water stuff, like because we've talked a little bit about Flint, some of the different legal loopholes, like kind of like uh, I know you, I know you've talked with um, an environmental fellow that's working with the Sanders campaign on some of this stuff. So, just can you give me a little brief overview of what you've been kind of doing. <laughs> I know that's a lot of stuff, but like, well, basically like with the different, like we talk about Flint, we talk about the Detroit water issues, we talk about West Virginia, for those I've mentioned it several times, you know, West Virginia had a chemical spill 
um, that caused you know initial issues with the response and the basically inability of anyone to be held responsible, government or actually from the bad actors themselves has been kind of problematic. Um, and there are certain loopholes. Like people are like, well, we don't know we were actually required to do this. Like with the Safe, Safe Drinking Water Act, for example, um, the the Tosca was it the toxic uh, chemicals. Uh, toxic chemicals basically regulation, this chemical was not even, it hadn't been updated in, certain, in a few decades, so the chemical wasn't even listed. So uh, with some of like, just, just some of the, with the water issues just in particular that you've been seeing, like what are some of the issues, the legal loopholes, or like what are some of the strategies that are being utilized um, to maybe, you know, work around? Sure. Um, I spoke with Senator Sanders' office this week, one of my friends, Jake Riott, works in his office as a legislative fellow for energy and environment and he's from Fayetteville, West Virginia. Okay. And got the job while he was there lobbying for the ACE Act, which is a bill that would hopefully ban mountaintop removal in its entirety. And basically he asked for some stakeholder input. Um, they're putting together an aid package for Flint that would be, I think, twenty million dollars that would be paid for through a bottle tax on soda and that sort of thing, and okay. possibly a tax on pharmaceuticals and chemical feedstock at the source. And I would agree with that. I told them, as in the case of carbon, and that's where we're headed with Citizens Climate Lobby, by the way, um, not to change gears, but that's a great group that I'm affiliated with here, and I've started the Southern West Virginia chapter where we're actively lobbying for a carbon fee and dividend where you would charge right at the source for carbon, $30 a ton, and that would be paid out to every man, woman, and child in dividends. And that would help okay. off medical costs, costs associated with cleanup. Um, most of these coal companies are self-bonded, and they're filing bankruptcy in light of um, their high supply, low demand, low coal prices, and uh, the increasing market share that renewables are gaining. So um, I've been working on building a team here in southern West Virginia to advocate for this carbon fee and dividend, which I might add that's a tough sell in southern West Virginia here in the coal fields. I'm people, sure. In the southern coal fields, yes, definitely. People aren't always receptive to it, but what's cool about that group is that John, Don Cheadle is on the board, so is Dr. James Hansen, a climate scientist with NASA, who was one of the first people to sort of ring the alarm bell about the climate crisis. Okay. And so this bottle tax and chemical tax would hopefully accomplish something similar to what a carbon fee would. And okay. uh, Senator Sanders' office is all over it, and it's good to see that. So one funny thing that they asked us about, um, where are all the loopholes? and all of the water laws. Wow, right. that's a huge question, right? <laughs> there are so many loopholes. These laws are very complicated. They're written by the industry, and there are plenty of loopholes. Um, we could identify weaknesses with all of the laws, um, with lots of approaches, and West Virginia Rivers Coalition has been mm -hmm. working on clarifying and strengthening uh, the jurisdiction of the Clean Water Act in order to cover headwater streams and wetlands, known as the Waters of the U.S. or WOTUS Clean Water Rule. And all okay. of our West Virginia congressional members have been blocking it. So uh, one glaring loophole that came to mind is that the RCRA, Restricted and Delegated Oversight of Federal Regulation to the state, mm -hmm. the problem with that is, and we saw this in the water crisis, states then say that no regulations will be more strict than the federal regulation. So that creates a sort right. of double exemption uh, we refer to as the dirty secret mirror. And sadly, stateside, um, this popular legislative policy wonk attitude is to defend these broken rules that we have while repeating the mantra, sometimes it's better to stop a bad bill than to pass a good one. And we were successful okay. in stopping a bad bill this year in the West Virginia legislature, specifically enforced pooling, which basically equals 
legalize robbery. That would give gas companies the right to, say, take property from people if a pipeline route were going across their property, for example. So by applying heavy-duty pressure through social media primarily and also through some boots on the ground at the Capitol, we were able to stop that bad bill this year. So it is often better to stop a bad bill than to pass a good one. Um, so a problem I've been working on specifically in my community that pertains to this is natural mm -hmm. well gas brine. Uh, natural gas well brine as well as produced brine, which is fracking waste. And they're not considered hazardous waste according to federal law, which is a huge problem. So they're not subject to all the protections that would normally apply. Um, as a result, we don't have stringent enough regulatory guidelines for disposal of waste handling or radon emissions. So both natural gas well brine and produced brine have roughly equal amounts of radium-226 and radium-228. And under the radiological health rules, the West Virginia DHHR should be testing for radium, and they're not doing it. They mm. don't do it since the DEP issues all the permits and regulates injection wells. The DEP has an agreement even to use this natural gas well brine as de-icer on our roads in Raleigh County, and that's especially okay, troubling. No one, you know, if they don't consider it hazmat and no one's testing for radium, yet they're spraying radioactive material on the road, that's a huge cause for concern. And um, with no one's testing for the radioactive elements, so we do have a leaking injection well in Ritchie County and also one in Wolf Creek and Lock Gilly, about 15 miles from where I am that's failed. And Dr. Susan Nagel just released a new study showing endocrine disruptors in Wolf Creek there in Fayette County. And that's quite troubling. So you're familiar with Dr. Raul Gupta. He's a great yes, guy. Yes. He's a wonderful man, but he's in now a bad position because he's appointed. So he's probably concerned with being fired, as would be the head of the DEP, if that makes sense. Anyone in an appointed position is in a precarious situation. So we asked Gupta last year why they don't test for radium, and he replied that basically he doesn't know where their authority lies and that he would follow up with the industry to see how that could be accomplished. He doesn't know how to implement the testing, and I think that the law should require the DHHR to conduct stringent testing for radium and other contaminants like benzene as a check right. and balance for the industry. So um, DEP seems to be more concerned with uh, being industry friendly as far as the permitting process goes. So um, basically the DHHR is on the health and medical side and they are more precautionary and they need to be forced to work together. So storage tanks handling fracking waste aren't deemed potential sources of contamination either. So we had a rather contentious hearing in Trap Hill last week, about seven miles from my home here, where I pressed the DEP for radium testing and pressed them on the loopholes, and they told me if I didn't like it to change the law, quote, end quote, which I intend to do. Um, Dr. Amjad, a candidate for mayor here in Beckley, she okay. was nice enough to attend the meeting with me, and she said that they were rude, unprofessional, and antagonistic, and she wants to bring in the EPA. And as we know, all these agencies failed during the water crisis. The yes. state failed. The water company failed. The EPA failed. So we can't even trust local water testing labs here in Raleigh County. One was shut down within the last year for faking samples. Um, I remember seeing that, yeah. That's a huge cause for concern. So, basically, as a result of the DEP dysfunction and industry side of bias, we'd like to push for better, stronger legislation on this radium testing. Um, as far as the SW, SDWA, the Halliburton loophole wasn't the only fracking enabler in the Energy <laughs> Policy Act. And there are laws in that, there's a hole in that law um, as it stands. 
FERC is entirely unaccountable to public will. Mm -hmm. They're unaccountable to Congress or even the White House. Commissioners are appointed to five-year terms and do as they please, and they rubber stamp all kinds of things for the fossil fuel industry. So, additionally, the Energy Policy Act repealed the most important anti-monopoly law, which is another huge problem that it would safeguard consumers from the overreach of the oil and gas industry. So, so, so Chris, Chris, it just seems like there are all these areas that are really important for like not just you know companies and the way like towns and cities do business but for everyday individual humans like public health safety and welfare and there's all this like there's all these gray areas there's all these gaps there's all these different people who don't want to take you know um, responsibility or accountability or take the lead on anything like as we're talking about citizen climate lobby, as we're talking about Friends of Water, as we're talking about this individual, you know, people with activist spirit, what do you think, what would be some suggestions? We're running, because I'm sorry, I ran over into our time, so we're running a little bit sure. short to close. But, like, what were some takeaways? Like, what would you advise people, kind of, definitely, you guys, go check out Friends of Water, Friends of Water on Twitter, Friends of Water is also on um, Facebook. Um, what, what are some takeaways you kind of think that we could, like, share people? Because this is, like... We're going to have to have another conversation about this, oh, yeah. you and I. I mean, Chris and I have been having conversations for like two years now about this stuff. Um, what are some takeaways? What are some things that people should be looking at or getting into? Or what are some strategies you think that can help, like, with citizen action? Right. Because um, we have issues with coal ash, you know, leaching into groundwater here in, in Georgia, for example, which I know has been a problem in West Virginia, North Carolina, and other places as well. So, like, all this stuff is very, very different, and I know everyone's like, but it's very similar. We're talking about the interaction between the different state and federal. And, you know, you heard him say lobbyists, right? Lobbyists have been writing laws and dictating laws. Campaign finance reform, anyone? Um, what, do you, what are some things that you just think, you know, That's going why forward? citizen lobby work is so crucial. Okay. And that is why grassroots organizing is so crucial. And that's also why citizen enforcement is absolutely the most important thing we can engage in. Um, unfortunately, we have to provide citizen oversight over these regulatory groups or regulatory agencies that fail us, and that's that's troubling. You'd like to think that we could just fix them, but right. it's not going to happen that way. So um, one way that I've seen um, us be successful in dealing with that is by holding their feet to the fire with aerial surveillance and by calling in violations on stream contamination on our own. Okay. And also, um, I've noticed that the big green groups aren't getting a lot done. The people who are actually making change and making things happen on the ground are small community grass action, grassroots action groups like us, right? So right, that, right. That seems to be a more effective tactic. So I've been talking with Angie Rosser about that at West Virginia Rivers Coalition. She's more of a policy wonk. And she was asking right. me, what's the best approach? Are we going to go for a statewide ban? That's going to be hard to do because the oil and gas industry has such a grip on West Virginia. Yes. So I think it's an all-of-the-above approach. I think that Fayette County just passed a model ordinance ban to ban the disposal of fracking waste through injection wells in their community. EQT, who also owns one of the huge pipeline projects where they're trying to ship natural gas overseas, um, they're fighting it in court using the same property rights argument we used against forced pooling, saying they're allowed to do what they want mm -hmm. with the property. But basically, it's going to take a lot of grassroots effort in terms of people standing up in their own communities. A lot of people within organizations call that the NIMBY effort, and they get frustrated with that, you know, the not right. in the backyard movement. Right. But that movement is golden because that's where the action happens. If you get enough people in your community to stand up with you and to say no, then you can make change. So that's been a huge takeaway for me, you know, continuing to see small, scrappy groups in West Virginia with no money getting a lot more done than the big ones with lots of resources. Well, that's what we saw, to go back to the West Virginia water crisis, that's our common connector, is that, you know, we had a lot of people who were never engaged, sound familiar guys, who were never engaged in the process before, never really cared what was going on, never really involved themselves, stand up and say no. 
I'm going to come give my testimony. You're going to listen to me, and we need more of that on a continuous basis across the board. So, Chris, I'm sorry to cut you short because I got to get ready because we're trying something new tonight. So I got to switch. You got to switch to a different channel for the next show. But I thank you so much, and I definitely would appreciate you coming back to talk to me some more because this is like this is huge. <laughs> I want to talk to you more about citizen lobbying in general because we've talked about this. I think Ralph, you know, has talked about this too because this is something we really need to do too. Just talk to people more about like what's possible, what can we be doing, how can we get initiatives like this started elsewhere. So definitely want to. You know, help bolster your efforts as much as possible. Thank you, Chris. Thank you, Anoa. Good to see you. Good to see you too. We need to schedule a, a Friends of Water, you know, get back the band together type of conversation anyway. So definitely we'll hit you up out on, offline after this. So thank you so much for joining me this evening. Thank you. So good to see you. All right. Good night, Chris. Yeah.